on that particular note that now that we have understood what is the challenges and opportunities in aquaculture sector, we will move to understand the context for fisheries sector. And we have, a, we have Dr. Cody O'Hara with us, who is the chief of party of Feed the Future Resilience, Resilient Communities Activities in Mozambique. Um, Dr. Uh, O'Hara is, a, uh, is specialized on ethical sourcing and value creation. He holds a PhD from Tufts University and his uh, research has been on to intersection between agriculture markets, diets, and gender and social inclusion. Um, Dr. Cody, please uh, tell us about what governance incoherence exists in local, national, and international level that's suppressing the sustainable natural resource management in coastal fisheries. Thank you, Kazi. Uh, that's uh, an excellent question and a very big one. I'll try not to take an hour or two uh, to answer it. Um, uh, I, I'll, I'll start by saying thank you for, for having me here. Uh, thank you for having me here on this incredible panel of, uh, of real doers and change makers from your, from your communities. Um, I, I would say looking at issues of governance uh, within uh, northern coastal Mozambique, the region of the country where I work is just the coastal districts, just the coastal areas, spanning about 730 kilometers of the coastline of northern Mozambique. Um, these are districts that are largely without major infrastructure, without much access to electricity, water of any kind, much less clean water, roads. Um, they are physically marginalized. Uh, the population there is, uh, is socially marginalized. Most of the population doesn't speak Portuguese, which is the dominant language of the country. Um, and so, as you could imagine, there are huge issues of uh, representation within the fishing, community and fishing communities in particular. Um, the, how that plays out, uh, I would say there are, there are enormous gaps between the vision for policy at the central level within Mozambique. The capital is almost 2,000 kilometers to the south of the part of the country where I work. So you can imagine that geographic distance is really represented also in terms of policy. And so a lot of what we're working on is really at the local level in terms of understanding grassroot, at the grassroots level what the opp opportunities are for representation in fisheries. Um, thinking specifically about the fisheries and fishing resources, um, I would reflect on the fact that the, if you are in Maputo, if you are in the capital, Anyone you talk to about fishing will tell you a story about fishing, overfishing, exploitation of the fishing that's happening uh, in those communities. No one will talk to you about the fact that just offshore, there are uh, large fishing ships coming in and trawling those waters, uh, international companies that are doing the majority of the fishing of the large economically productive fish, like tuna, for example. Uh, no one really in Maputo is talking about the violation of international agreements that is allowing those boats to come inshore uh, closer than they should be. Everyone will tell you about how particular fishing practices in those communities are, are uh, damaging those fishing stocks. It's certainly true that some of the practices that are being practiced within those communities are harmful. Um, some of that is, is built on just desperation um, fishing is seen as a, a um, subsistence activity. It's not really seen as economically productive. It can be econo economically productive, but a lot of the fishing communities, especially in the more remote areas, are not really tied into market systems. And so the fish that are brought in are, are used for subsistence. Um, similarly, uh, the, well, and because of this, what you'll find is that um, people are using mosquito bed nets, for example, to pull in anything they possibly can because they need to feed their family at the end of the day. Um, you will also hear stories, for example, about how uh, women have particular roles in those fisheries. Women are the ones inshore, and the men are the ones who go out on boats and, uh, and do the, big, the deep sea fishing. And I really appreciated hearing from Suzanne your story about getting into that boat, because it's culturally very similar in northern Mozambique. Uh, women are not allowed in the boats. In particular, women are, not, women are considered bad luck if they're in a boat with men. And so just as another uh, very positive example and one that we really want to hold up to women in other communities, uh, there in one particular community in Memba district, um, we found a group of extremely powerful women 
who are uh, free divers and spear fishers. And they weren't allowed in the boat with the men. So they got their own boat. And they go out into the sea and they do the spear fishing and they're bringing in those economically productive fish. They're participating in those markets that are available in that community. And, uh, and they are some of the strongest women you have ever met. And so we want to be able to hold up these women within other communities and be able to break down some of those boundaries and say, say look, just because, uh, just because you may think that fishing is a man's job, um, that doesn't mean that this can't be an opportunity for you as well. Thank you, Cory. Um, on the second note, I would like you to tell us more about what you think is needed to be done to bring more transformational action into the kind of geographies you are currently working with. Um, thanks, Kazi. I think I can, I can speak most easily to the kind of work that we are doing and to the vision that we've, we've set within those communities. Uh, so as I mentioned uh, before, we are trying to work at the grassroots level. There are very important reasons for this. Uh, for example, again, thinking about governance, there are many different bodies that are working uh, around something related to natural resources management, conservation, and resilience. Um, they are not well coordinated. Uh, very often they have access to resources that they don't even know about. Uh, there's very little preparation for these kinds of community level natural resource management committees uh, around how they can access resources that are available to them. Um, there are some very large companies uh, working in the area, particularly in the extractive industries. Um, the entire coastline of northern Mozambique, every single bit of that coastline has been given in a concession to a mining company. And these are, uh, a lot of the mining companies are, uh, are Chinese. They work in uh, a, a bit of a, a um, there, there's no transparency into their operations. There's no real connection to the communities. Many of the workers are brought in and don't speak any of the local languages. Um, and, and we just see the resources flowing out of the communities. Officially, those communities are allowed access to some of that income that's coming into the, to the, to the mining companies. But there's no easy way to prepare those communities to understand how they can access those resources. So at a policy level, there's a really important mechanism that needs to be established that we're working on in terms of enabling those kinds of natural resource management committees to, uh, to understand the best ways to access those resources that are available for their own infrastructure development, for their own planning, um, for their own community-led adaptation efforts. We really are working, though, with people, uh, I would say, in three, three main pillars. Uh, one of them is, in a, is establishing new economic opportunities. Um, we're a consortium of, of four main partners. Uh, I work for IDE. IDE is really leading this economic development aspect of the work. Um, and one of the important pieces is that if you're a, from a fishing household, you see yourself as a fisher. That is what you do. That's, the, that's, that's what you do on a daily basis. And culturally, that's a, that's a very important piece. Young people are not engaging in that. They are not interested in that. They see this as work. They don't see this as an employment opportunity or an economic livelihood. So we are working to provide additional uh, uh, economic opportunities to be able to inspire youth, uh, to understand that there are other opportunities for young women as well as young men uh, within communities. And there are a lot of them. Um, natural resource conservation is really the second main pillar of the, uh, of the project. And we're uh, focused on many different areas. It's a large project. Um, that effort is really led by, uh, by RARE, another international NGO, um, and, uh, and has, an effort, has, has a focus, for example, on, um, on mangroves. Um, there are a lot of economic opportunities within mangroves, for example, with honey production, uh, within mangroves, which is a very valuable, uh, very valuable product, even in the local markets. Um, that give an economic incentive to maintain mangroves and to prevent some of the deforestation from mangroves. And there are, there are other opportunities as well. Um, I, something, something else that uh, Dr. Shakuntala mentioned uh, as well, though, is also data. And I think an important part of the natural resource conservation effort is understanding who is fishing, registering them, figuring out how much they're actually fishing, what are they bringing in in terms of, their, uh, in terms of the catch, 
uh, monitoring, is the catch really declining, as so many people say, in terms of uh, establishing marine protected areas to enable the replenishment of the fish? How well is that working? Being able to demonstrate that with data even to the communities is, a, is an incredibly important tool for us. Um, that knowledge piece is, is a really important part, uh, ensuring that the communities are aware of the value of maintaining the fisheries and, uh, and creating um, uh, 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 marine protected areas uh, to enable that replenishment, I think is a really important piece. And that also ties in with this third pillar of the project led by a Mozambican NGO called H2N, fantastic organization. They're great partners to work with and I highly recommend uh, looking them up. Um, and, but their main focus is around behavior change. And just to highlight, none of these efforts would work without behavior change. I think this is probably something that you're going to hear throughout this, uh, throughout this panel, that changing, changing people's behavior, changing men's behavior toward women, and understanding that relationship between, uh, between uh, people within communities, I think, will be a critical aspect. <clears throat> 